So, um, uh, as I mentioned to you last week, uh, I'm, this week's uh, class will be somewhat themed, and the theme will be the influence of Hasidic music on early Israeli or uh, Halutzic song. Um, and uh, I'll start where we left off last week. The very last song we looked at last week, to remind you, uh, is one that is called popularly Rad Halayla, right? Night Has Descended, but which we saw was originally written as Rav Halayla, right? The, the night is yet long. And uh, I read to you, <clears throat> and I will repeat it again now, uh, a little blurb that the uh, lyricist Yaakov Orland wrote about uh, the song Rav Halayla. He wrote, and again, I'm just quoting from him, my father was a very religious man who went to shul every day. On Shabbatot and on holidays, he would return from shul uh, filled with songs and, and that he had uh, heard and that he would repeat to himself. However, he didn't have such a perfect recollection of the song. So one time he returned from shul while he was humming a Hasidic nigun that he had heard when he attended the Beit Midrash of the Boyana Hasidim in Jerusalem. And his face was shining as he hummed this tune, and indeed it was a very beautiful tune. Um, so I said to my father, maybe what I should do is write some words to this tune, so that if you remember the words, then you'll remember the tune. <clears throat> and I did so. And that is how Rav Halayla was born. Now, just to remind you briefly, the tune went as follows. Okay. And it repeated itself and then it went So I was reminded after the class that I knew another word, another song, other words that were put to that same tune. So what we have here to begin with is something to which I found no recording, uh, not likely that it would be recorded because it was rather a particular song. It was sung only in B'nai Akiva in the religious Zionist youth movement, uh, and it was put to the tune of uh, Rav Halayla. Um, it simply expresses a uh, the, um, the uh, uh, hope is kind of like the desire of members of that religious Zionist youth organization to go on Aliyah and to join one of the religious Zionist kibbutzim. Uh, and the words are, Hoyachim Mavriah, brothers, let's uh, shout, Adasher Nagia, until we arrive, Likfutzad Bnei Akiva, at one of the Bnei Akiva kibbutzim. Hoy Matai Hayom, when will the day arrive? Yidgashem HaChalom, and our dream will be fulfilled. What dream? Chalom Yimei Hani'urim, the dream that we all had when we were children. And to the tune of Rav Halayla, it goes, Hoyachim Nariya, Dasher Nagira, Likfutzad Bnei Akiva. Hoyachim Nariya, Dasher Nagira, Likfutzad Bnei Akiva. Hoy mataya vo hayom yit gashem ha chalom chalom yemeha neurim. Hoy mataya vo hayom yit gashem ha chalom chalom yemeha neurim. So again, this is just simply another illustration of the impact that Hasidic tunes had on early Israeli song. And interestingly enough, that is the origin of one of the most famous Jewish songs ever, ever written, Hava Nagila. And we're going to touch, touch a little bit on the history of Hava Nagila. Um, the words, as you see, were composed by Avraham Tzvi Idelson. I'll have a good deal to say about him in just a moment. And the tune is called Amami Chasidi, right? A, a kind of folk tune, a Hasidic folk tune. And it says, Ktiva, it was composed in 1917. That means that the words to the tune, the words were adapted to the tune in 1917. 
And here you see the very first um, instance of the publication of the tune of Hava Nagila. And like one of the examples that we saw previously, if you take a careful look at it, you'll see that it reads from right to left, rather than the usual reading of even Hebrew music, which generally goes from left to right. So here you can see the ha all the way on the right side, as opposed to being on the left. So a word or two, or actually several words, about the uh, composer or arranger Avraham Tzvi Idelson. Idelson was born in Eastern Europe in the early uh, 1880s and trained in Russia as a cantor, as a chazan, but also studied classical music in conservatories in Germany before settling in Jerusalem in 1905 when he was about 23 years old. And he soon became active as a musician, as a music teacher, and as a scholar in the Jewish community there. His scholarship was what today is called ethnomusicology. A passionate Zionist, Idelson sought on the one hand to collect and to preserve the folk mu music of Jewish communities who were represented in Jerusalem in the very early part of the 20th century, which means largely Jews of either German, Russian, Moroccan or Yemenite origin. And at the same time, he also sought to pioneer a new style of Jewish, modern Jewish national music that somehow could have something that appealed to all of the different Jewish groups as they returned to their historic home in Palestine. To that end, he composed and arranged many new Hebrew language songs of his own based largely on traditional melodies. These modern songs with ancient roots quickly became as popular uh, as possible, as popular as new Hebrew folk songs. They were sung in kibbutzim, in moshavim. They were printed in early Hebrew songbooks in pre-state Israel. And among them was Hava Nagila. Now, here's the origin of Hava Nagila. First, the tune. The tune, according to Idelson, uh, was a tune that he got from the Sadegora Hasidim. Now, it's an interesting thing, because if you remember, the tune for Rav Halayla came from the Boyana Hasidim. The Boyana Hasidim are actually an offshoot of the Sadigora Hasidim. So here we have actually one Hasidic dynasty, so to speak, the Sadigora Boyana dynasty, right, which apparently was rather well or maybe even overrepresented in terms of tunes or melodies that circulated in the in, in pre-Israel Palestine. Um, and uh, Idelson uh, became acquainted with it in 1915 when he was serving, listen to this, as a bandmaster in the Ottoman army during World War I. Okay. Now, although he served in the Ottoman army, the Ottomans, of course, were defeated by the Allies. And in 1918, Idelson selected this tune for a celebration concert performed in Jerusalem after the British army had defeated the Turks and after General Allenby had come and liberated Jerusalem. And he arranged the melody in four parts. And to this melody, he added a Hebrew text that he derived largely from the book of Tehillim. The pasuk that we say in Hallel, Ze hayom asa Hashem, Nagila v'nismacha bo, that this is a day which we thank God for and is a day on which we will rejoice and we will be merry. So from Nagila v'nismacha bo, we get the Hava Nagila. Nuranana, Raninu is a frequent word in Sefer Tehillim, but of course the modern touch is the Uru Achim Belev Sameach, where he talks to other fellow pioneers as brothers, which was very common in that uh, socialist uh, society. Um, the words then, of course, echo 
ופסוק of זה היום עשה השם נגילה ונשמחה בו, and Edelson himself wrote, and I quote, the choir sang it, and it apparently caught the imagination of the people. For the very next day, men and women were singing the song throughout Jerusalem. In no time at all, it spread throughout the country and thence throughout the Jewish world. Now, uh, there are scores of different performances of Havana Gila, uh, and I just simply chose one not entirely at random, but I went through uh, several of them. But there's one that I particularly um, thought uh, I, I liked, uh, and therefore you're stuck with it because you'll just have to. And here we go. Listen, you know what I want very much to do? I want to sing with you one of the most exciting songs I have ever heard in my life. Which one? Havana Gila. Okay. All right? All right. For those of you who don't recognize Harry Belafonte on the left and, of course, Danny Kaye on the right. Little Chazon is there at the end as well. Okay. Uh, sometimes Hasidic tunes were uh, put to, uh, not to new Hebrew words, but to uh, classic uh, Hebrew texts. Um, I included this one, Mia Gorba O Halacha, uh, which is a, a biblical verse, okay? Uh, it's from the book of Tehillim, right? Mi agur ba'olecha, God who will take up residence in your tent, mi ishkon bar kodshecha, who can reside on your holy mountain in the Beit HaMikdash, holech tamim, somebody who walks a straight line, po'el tzedek, who acts righteously, dover emet, who always speaks the truth. It's a pasuk straight out of Tehillim, okay? You'll recognize the tune, I hope,
Okay. Samachta becha gecha vehayita achsameaf. Okay. So of course, to the tune of this Samachta becha gecha, uh, I incorporated this um, for one particular reason. And that is, it may not appear on the surface to be a song <coughs> particular to the Chalutzim. But my research uh, actually indicated that this tune with these words became the anthem uh, of the Jerusalem-based uh, organization, youth organization, called Legion HaTzofim, perhaps one of the precursors of the Boy Scouts in Israel. And subsequently, uh, during the 1940s and thereabouts, uh, it became a favorite of the youth movement called Machanot Olim, children who came to Israel either as part of organized youth movements or, or the like. Uh, so for that reason, I, I thought it actually fit the bill uh, of a uh, Zionist song that was inspired by a Hasidic melody. And that takes us to the next song, which again, you might uh, know the song, but not have appreciated that it was based on a Hasidic uh, melody. Uh, and that is the song Zemer Zemer Lach, uh, written by Avraham ben Ze'ev. Again, the tune is called Amami, a folk tune. Um, and here, it, it's attributed, it says, K'tivad, it was written Shnota Arba'im, sometime during the 1940s. Okay, let's listen to it first, and then uh, I can say a bit more about it. Lots of choices here. Um, I'll just pick the first one that's here. Okay, Mechorati um, uh, is my homeland. Um, you may be acquainted with the Hebrew word kur, which is a, 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 a either a, 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 a describe it, a crucible. 
so it, it, it's something, uh, something from which other things uh, emerge or originate. So Mechorati, my homeland, Hamagal Sovei, <clears throat> the circle <clears throat> goes about, uh, ostensibly a circle of dancers, Zemer Lach Dovev, as it sings a song to you, Zemer Lach Mechorati, and the song is dedicated to the homeland. Hararayach, the mountains, Yismachu will rejoice, Eit Mechol HaHora Yisar, when the Hora dance uh, breaks out, Elef Prachim, a thousand flowers, Lefeta Yifrachu, all of a sudden will blossom, Yechasu Eten HaMidbar, and they will coat, they will cover uh, the, uh, the desert or the wilderness. Um, the curious thing is that when the, uh, when the um, lyricist, Avraham ben Ze'ev, was interviewed uh, about this uh, song uh, some 60 years ago, he was asked where he got the tune from, and he said that he heard the tune being hummed by a Bulgarian Jew. And he assumed that the tune was Bulgarian, and since the majority of Bulgarian Jews were Sephardic, so he assumed that it was some sort of a Spanish or Spanish-like melody. That at least was his impression of it. Um, researchers, however, musicologists, uh, discovered that the tune was not uh, Spanish in origin. Uh, and that it's likely that this Bulgarian Jew simply picked the tune up from a Hasidic Jew whom he heard humming it, because the tune once again goes to that same dynasty that we've already seen represented twice in Hebrew songs, the Sadegora Boyana dynasty. And it would appear once again that the tune originated there and it spread amongst non-Hasidic Jews uh, as well. And from this particular Bulgarian Jew, it made its way to Avraham ben Ze'ev, who was then able to adapt it for the song Zemer Zemer Lach. Um, the, uh, again, the lyricist, uh, when asked about his composition, said that he had really no intention, and for that matter, not even any desire to write a folk song. Um, he said that he was writing the song for a rather limited audience. He was himself a kibbutznik, and it was um, common for kibbutz members to sing, um, not only in evenings before they retired, but they would sing occasionally while they were working. They would sing on their way to work. They would sing on their way back from work. Um, and. Uh, that indeed was his sole intention, to write something for his fellow uh, kibbutznikim to be able to sing. And he was rather surprised that the song actually made its way beyond the, uh, the borders of the kibbutz itself. Okay, sorry about this. Okay. Now, to another oldie but goodie, I'm sure you're well acquainted with Arza Alino, kind of like Hava Nagila. It's a song that's been around forever and ever, and you get one of those things that people rarely inquire into its origins. And here, once again, we will discover that uh, the words might have been modern, but the tune was uh, more traditional. So, um, the words Artsa Alinu, we've gone up to the land of Israel. Artsa Alinu means the same thing the second time around. Artsa Alinu, same thing again even the third time around. Kvar Harashnu, we have plowed. The Gamzara'anu, and we have planted. Aval, Odlo Katsarnu, but we have not yet uh, harvested. And indeed, this song, like its predecessors, has its origin in a particular situation, a particular agricultural situation. Um, the uh, lyricist Shmuel Navon um, went out for a, uh, a, a tiul in the Jezreel Valley. And uh, while he was on his uh, tiul, he saw farmers plowing and planting. 
and it uh, awakened in him this uh, idea that he would write a song about these farmers. And since he saw them only early in the season, when they were still only planting, uh, only plowing and planting, right? It was much too early yet for them to harvest. And yet he knew that eventually what they planted would grow and they would be able to harvest it. So he incorporated that idea into his song as well. And indeed, one can say arguably that this is pretty much a, 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 a boilerplate Zionist theme, right? The idea that we go out today to plow, we'll go out tomorrow to plant, and we'll wait for the third day, metaphorically speaking, till we can go out and harvest what we have planted. Um, so um, he wrote the words inspired by the activity, by the agricultural activity that he had witnessed, um, but he had not yet put a tune to it. That happened at a later stage. What Shmuel Navon did for a living was that he was an educator. And uh, he, uh, he uh, in, in a kibbutz, okay? Uh, and one evening, while he was on kitchen duty with some of his students, he decided to put a tune to the words, right? He started humming a tune, right? And the students joined him in the tune. And then he said, why don't we put some words to it? So he put words to it. And then both he and his students ended up singing the words of Arts Alinu to the Hasidic tune that he had adapted for this uh, purpose. Um, and here it is. Um, a curious postscript uh, to this song uh, is that, uh, again, the lyricist, Shmuel Navon, um, sang the song once uh, uh, for a guest uh, at his kibbutz, Chaim Nachman Bialik. Bialik so took to the song that when he went back to Tel Aviv, he sang it um, to people who would gather in his house on Friday nights um, for what was called an Oneg Shabbat. Um, uh, you know, uh, even in the 1920s uh, in Tel Aviv, um, you know, even non-religious people had, I guess, what we'd call uh, Yiddish Neshama meaning uh, they had long since parted company from religious practice, but they still had a strong feeling for uh, religion and for tradition. Uh, and therefore they understood implicitly that even though they weren't, the, they weren't going to shul on Friday night or on Shabbat, that the day deserved to be uh, marked as something more than just a day off from work. And there arose a tradition 
that started in Bialik's house of gathering together on Friday nights for something that was officially called an Oneg Shabbat. Now, it, it didn't consist of Divrei Torah. Uh, more often than not, it consisted of things that were either cultural or political. But it also, uh, they also would begin the evening or end the evening with singing. Um, after a while, these became so popular that they had to move it out of Bialik's home. And uh, it eventually moved to uh, an auditorium in the Gymnasia, uh, the Gymnasia Rachavia in Tel Aviv, uh, which I am told held even upwards of a thousand people, and that they would draw pretty much that many people on Friday nights to these Oneg Shabbat uh, forums. So uh, because Bialik was the one who introduced it to this Friday night forum at his house, there were people who somehow identified the song with him. And for a period of time, if you would ask people who wrote Artsa Alinu, they would say, oh, Bialik wrote it, not at all being aware of the fact that Bialik himself had learned it from the original lyricist from Shmuel Navon. And of course, like many uh, Zionist songs, um, it, it uh, lent itself to parody. Uh, and here the bottom two lines represent a much later parody of the song. Uh, Artsa Alinu, Artsa Alinu, Artsa Alinu. But rather than uh, focusing on the harisha, the plowing, this ri'ah, the planting, and the kitsira, the harvesting, it goes, Artsa alinu eze shtut asinu. What a terrible mistake we made. Artsa alinu eze shtut asinu. Nelech b'chazara. Shouldn't we just turn around and go home? The last series uh, of songs that I have here also put to Hasidic melodies. Um, well, Let's see uh, uh, if you can uh, if you can uh, identify the uh, better known words to this same melody. The words, as you see, uh, are called the, the poem is called Chazak Lev. These actually, if you take a look, uh, who wrote the milim? It's curious. Uh, these aren't even modern milim. They're not biblical nor modern. They're actually medieval. They come from a philosophical book by a 14th century Spanish author named uh, Shem Tov Ben Yosef Falquera, rather known in the, uh, in the school of Maimonidian uh, philosophers, um, and was as was the habit in those days. Uh, he would punctuate his philosophical prose with poetry. So these are basically three or four poetic lines that interrupt a philosophical discourse. And the meaning of the words really isn't uh, significant, but I, I'll do my best to translate them anyway. Im aid, aid is a mist or a cloud of vapor, kamosela, if in fact it is tangible, kamopatishani, and I want to enter into it, then I have to be like a hammer. The im kamayim, if however it's not um, uh, formidable, if it's not uh, solid like a rock, if, however, it's fluid like water, and if, uh, if difficulty um, is uh, something fleeting, kamayim, again, that it flows like water, libi, uh, then my heart, when it encounters this, will make itself stronger in order to be able to meet the challenge. Because it's like a crescent moon, which we know, Indeed, if it's the waxing moon rather than the waning moon, so we know that it will simply, it may now be weak, it may now be only a crescent, but it will grow uh, larger as time goes on. But the important thing here, as I said, is the tune, so listen carefully. Uh, which one are we going to do here? Okay. Pishtanim, 
So two things about this. Um, one is that the recording that I chose um, is uh, the song was sung by Vatike, the veterans of Machanot HaOlim. I mentioned previously that some of these songs became popular in youth movements and the like, and that one of these movements in which these songs with the Hasidic tunes became popular was called the movement of Machanot HaOlim, right? Of those who came largely uh, young people who came to Israel sometimes unaccompanied uh, and lived together in these uh, youth villages. The second thing is that the tune, uh, if you, uh, again, it may not have been recognizable, it is a Hasidic tune that is often put to the words of part of the, uh, part of the uh, Yom Tov um, Musaf uh, that uh, usually uh, etc. Et as indeed you may have recognized them. Uh, and again, this tune also was popular in the Oneg Shabbat forums uh, that were held originally, as I said, in Bialik's house and subsequently in other auditoriums uh, in Tel Aviv. Uh, and uh, again, just to emphasize the fact that um, that uh, the tune itself uh, was a relative newcomer. Uh, you can recognize it here in this Yiddish folk song. Okay, the song itself is entitled, if you catch the words, Zog Mir Dushena Megala, tell me or speak to me, pretty girl. Okay. Um, let me, I'm going to skip this one just for now. If we can time, I'll come back to it. Okay. Um, here we come again. Uh, to uh, okay, um, yeah, I can do that. All right. Um, so again, um, this one uh, is called Rov Brachot, and um, again. Uh, written somewhere in the early 1940s, Rov Brachot, right, uh, uh, lots of blessings or greetings, Hod V'yakar, uh, grandeur, glory, L'chag HaSukot, right, particularly for the Sukkot holiday, why? Chag HaIkar, 
because it's not just an agricultural festival. I mean, obviously, Pesach and Shavuot have agricultural significances also, but Sukkot, but Sukkot is, is largely the Chag HaAsif. It's the time of the, of the harvest, and it's one that highlights uh, the uh, activities of, of farmers. Okay? The Chag HaAsif, again, as I mentioned, it's the harvest time, the Chag HaSukkot, Nishkach kol amal, right? During the festival, we are given to forget or to overlook all of our travail. V'chol mitzukot in any distress that we might have suffered. Shtu hayayin, right? We can drink wine, we can celebrate. Bidim at ayin, right? Uh, in place of tears. Be'iri Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim. And where do we celebrate? We celebrate in Jerusalem. Can't tell really from the words, and I came across nothing in the discussions, whether this is um, contemporary or whether this is nostalgic. Meaning, is it simply that people would come to Jerusalem even in the 1940s on the Shalosh Regalim? Or is it somebody harking back to the biblical period in which people were obliged to come to Jerusalem during the pilgrimage festivals? Can't really tell. But one way or the other, here is the song. A curious thing is that when he was interviewed, when Matityahu Shalem, the lyricist, was interviewed about this song, again, somewhere about 60 years ago, you can get the sense that somehow in the early 60s, somebody in Israel began to realize that the lyricists and composers uh, of these classic songs were dying, and that somebody better quickly interview them in order to preserve the information for the historical record. So when Matityahu Shalem was interviewed about this song, he basically said as follows, and I'll, I'll, I'll read you a quotation. He says, Lu limchok et ze, If I could simply erase this song, hayiti mochek, I would erase it. Haya eze ma'archon chizayon mevusas al mikorot shal ahavat ziyon vinyan sukkot. I must have some point, he said, had this kind of almost a delusion about the grandeur of the Zionist vision and linking it specifically to the sukkot holiday. Lo avadati al ashir hazeh kol kach. I didn't really put much effort into this. Hu haya letzorach hasha'a. It's just simply something that served a, a, a momentary purpose. Acharkach, he says, subsequently, hitchati lak pidyoter, I was more careful. So apparently, he does not consider this to be, have been one of his better compositions. But again, we're talking here only about the words, not about the tune. When I played this, I said to myself, ah, I heard, I know another song to the same tune. And that's the last one that you have here. And let me tell you something uh, about it. Okay, uh, it's called Himnon Chativat Sheva. Chativa is a brigade. Chativat Sheva is Brigade Seven. Himnon Chativat Sheva would make it then the anthem of the Seventh Brigade. Now the curious thing here is that notice who wrote the words. The words were written by 
Rabbi Moshe Tzvi Neria. You may remember in an earlier session, we saw his uh, poem, Yad Achim, that became the anthem of the Bnei Akiva movement. Um, Rabbi Neria, to remind you, was a student of, uh, of Rabbi Cook, and he was the founder of the first Bnei Akiva High School, the Yeshivat Bnei Akiva, which still is situated in central Israel in Kfar HaRo'eh, the letters of Ro'eh, Reish Aleph Hay, standing for Rabbi Avraham HaKohen, commemorating Rabbi Cook. Um, so clearly Rabbi Neria had this poetic bent. But here the interesting thing is that he was writing a song for soldiers. Okay. Um, the, uh, this, uh, this, uh, 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 this brigade, this seventh brigade, uh, fought in the Galilee during Milchemet Ha'atzma'ut, during the Israeli War of Independence. And uh, a particular Shabbat in November of 1948, right, which would mean six months after the state of Israel declared its independence, while the war essentially was still going on, this particular Shabbat in November of 1948 was declared a Shabbat Hodaya, a Shabbat of Thanksgiving, um, to celebrate the fact that the Galil, the Galilee, had been liberated in, in, in a, a Israeli army um, uh, uh, move um, that at the time was called Mivza Hiram, Operation Hiram. Hiram, if you may recall biblically, was the king of Tyre, the king of Tzor, southern Lebanon. So it has an association with the Galilee, with the northern part of Israel. And Rabbi Neria um, uh, uh, apparently um, uh, spent that Shabbat with uh, members of this, uh, of this brigade. Uh, and um, and he wrote this poem to help them uh, celebrate and commemorate their victory. Now, why was it put to the same tune as the previous song? Because when Rabbi Neria first came to this brigade, he heard them singing a song of their own. They were singing Rov Brachot. So he took advantage of the fact that they already knew the tune, and therefore to this tune, he wrote the following words, Sahali, rejoice Varoni and celebrate Chativat Sheva, the seventh brigade, Hanodaat, which has this reputation that spreads Minidan all the way from the northern part of Israel, Ad Ber Sheva in the south, Tzur Yisrael, of course, God, Nitzachon Lachin Chil, granted this brigade a victory. Chel Shir its armored force, Shichrer HaGalil liberated the Galilee. Shir HaMa'alot, a typical biblical uh, phrase, a, a song of ascent. El HaGivaot, as we go up to the hills, to the Galilee, which not only is in the northern part of Israel, but also is hill country. El Heharim Esa Enai, again an adaptation of the biblical verse, right? I look up to the mountains. I look up to Meron, which is of course associated with Rabbi Shimon. Okay? So E Lefanayich Bar Yochai is as though Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai himself was marching at the head of the seventh brigade when it liberated Meron and other places in the Galilee. Um, and uh, here, I'll just let you in on this, even though there's absolutely no music uh, to it. Um, as you can see, for some reason, the Zemer Reshet people preserved the lyrics, but were unable to record the song, so you'll just have to suffer through my, uh, uh, my singing. I heard learned the song um, as follows. Sahali Varoni Hativa Cheva Hanoda at me dan via Bersheva Sur Israel Nitzahon Lachin Hill Hel Shir Yone Shikre Hagalil 
שירה מעלות אל הגבעות, אל ההרים אשא עיניי, ממירון רבי שמרון, צועד לפנייך בר יוחאי, ואמרתם כל אחי, רבי שמרון בר יוחאי, ואמרתם כל אחי, רבי שמעון בר יוחאי ממירום רבי שמעון צועד לפנייך בר יוחאי. And that pretty much rounds out. We skipped one. And I see we do have a few minutes, so I can go back and, uh, and uh, introduce you to it. We skipped uh, just an account of the constraints of time, sobu, sobu, sov, right? Round and about, round and about, hamagal higbiru, right? Increase the circle of dancers, sobu, sobu, shiratchem ha'adiru, uh, make your song resound. Yad I think you need to change the screen you're sharing. Just just flip the screen. Thank you. Pardon? Well, you, you've got this, this is uh, just on the, on the, okay. uh, it's okay. It's in the uh, in the sources. Okay, yad el yad, katef el katef, arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder. And here's an interesting interpolation here of a Talmudic phrase: O chevruta, o mituta. Chevruta um, means camaraderie. Uh, mituta means death. Uh, it's a Talmudic phrase. The Talmudic phrase is supposed to say that people. Um, get along that people are social animals, they need one another, and that loneliness is not a particularly good thing. So the Talmudic phrase is introduced here in the sense of people who are holding hands with each other and are shoulder to shoulder, shoulder to shoulder, obviously prefer chevruta, prefer camaraderie, right, to loneliness. And if their case, if in fact they join together, im gam yavo, im gam yom yavo shachor mi shachor, if there is even a dark day, a depressing day, diglenu ba'oz na'lim de krata or we'll still be able to raise our flag in anticipation of the coming light. And again, sobu 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 hamagalak biru, increase the the uh, the uh, circle of dance and shiratchem ha'adiru and uh, and let you and break forth in song. And here again to a. A Hasidic melody. Okay, pretty much. So, so, Amagadag Biru, so, so, Shiratremadiru. Sobu, sobu, amagalak biru. Sobu, sobu, shirat remadiru. Yad el yad, rechad nefel katef. O chavruta, o mituta. Livshu, livshu oz. Ve'im gam yom yavo, ve'u shachor mishchor. Bum 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 Two words that he sang that aren't in the text anyway, Lib Shu O's, be strong. But again, that's the that, as we've already noted on a number of occasions, is rather typical of folk songs that they take on a life of their own that wasn't necessarily anticipated by their original composers, lyricists, or composers. Let me take a look at the chat before our time is gone. Gymnasia. Uh, um, uh, well, no, gymnasium would be the Latin, and then the Hebraicized form was gymnasia. Um, uh, circus in Hebrew became kirkas, uh, theater in Hebrew became teatron, and gymnasium became gymnasia. That's, that's, I'm not responsible for it, but that's what it is. Exactly. Or oh, somebody even anticipated me. Gymnasium is Latin, and gymnasia is the, is the Hebraic form. Uh, okay, and the origin of the word is probably Greek. Uh, 
that's it. Okay, so to uh, all of you classicists, uh, thank you for your uh, assistance. Uh, a reminder again that next week as part of the Pesach program, I'll be talking about what is Haroset. Uh, and the following weeks are uh, Erev, almost Erev Pesach and Pesach on which we're not going to meet. So uh, this part of the uh, class that is devoted to songs of the Chalutzim uh, will resume after the Pesach holiday. Uh, so to each and every one of you and to all of you collectively, a Chag Sameach, enjoy the holiday. Uh, if you can make it in next week for the Haroset class, uh, I will enjoy your company. Otherwise, enjoy it at the Seder in any event. Take Thank care. you, Dr. Sokolo. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Please take a look at our upcoming classes for Pesach. Take a break or have us on in the background. Um, whatever you whatever you can do. And if you have any questions at all, please email me at info at torinmotion.org. Looking forward to seeing all of you again soon. Chodesh Tov, Chag Sameach, Besorot Tovot, all good things. See you all soon. So Shira, the next class, other than the um, the Haraset class, is the 18th of April, is that correct? For Dr. Sokolo? Yes, this one. Let me, let me take a look at the calendar with you. So we are, next week, yes, we have a Pesach class, and then it will be Pesach, yes, that's correct, right, Dr. Sokolo, the 18th, we'll be resuming the Halutim, the songs of the Halutim. Thank, Thank you, you, Esther. Looking forward to it. Me too. All the best. Bye-bye, everybody. Before, what do you mean before I close down? I, 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 I,